Here are some of a few organizations that exist within the atheist slash secular community, including some that I just mentioned, and including ours. You have groups that focus on black atheists, like black non-believers. You have American Atheists, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and other organizations that focus primarily on church and state separation activism. You also have other groups that focus on students. We have the executive director in the audience today. So we also have Sunday Assembly. So we have much more representation in the community than we did a few years ago. And one thing that we must understand is that all of our organizations are important. Because what this shows is an expansion of a community that was considered still very myopic or very limited in its scope a few years ago, which was limited to primarily white men. This has changed over the years. And the organization and the community and the representation has changed and it needs to continue to change. And there's more to the community than just the organizations. <clears throat> we have the national, we also have regional and local groups, uh, many who are here in Atlanta. We have bloggers, writers, <coughs> podcasters, organizers, and most importantly, the people. A community is nothing without the people that who belong to it, who participate, who volunteer, and for some who get paid. But all of those aspects make up the community. Now, there is <coughs> I and I in the community, but it is and should be all about we. In starting black non-believers, we knew that there were more black atheists out there. Yes, the black community, the new pre Pew Research numbers have most of, have the black community identifying like 87%. That is still a very staggering number. However, and, and most of the people who may identify as religious may not, they may loosely identify as Christian, but they're still identifying as religious. So it is still very much a challenge to openly identify as an atheist or to even say that you're questioning. But we knew that there were more of us out here and that it was up to us, <coughs> partially, but majority, you know, but majorly, to help bring us out. So in doing that, in creating the organization and in building the community, these are some of the things that we have done. So at our table, that is right outside on the skeptic track, when you're the skeptic track, we have our Charlotte affiliate organizer, Tina Marshall, and these are some of her members. They volunteer with Atheist Alliance helping the homeless. Black Nonbelievers as an organization has not sought to exist in a vacuum. We knew that we were a part of two communities, the black community and the secular community. That is intersectionality. And that is something that some in the community have been trying to avoid, but when you have people who come from marginalized communities, it cannot be. And certainly, atheists are part of a marginalized community. So you have more of us. Uh, in building our community, we've also expanded our branding. We have merchandise that we sell at our table, and as you can see here, we have all sorts of folks who wear it, who support us. So take a note of that, especially after this talk. <laughs> So we also hosted various events. Uh, one of the pictures is from our um, potluck that we had for Thanksgiving. Because the holidays can be a very, very challenging time for many atheists and non-believers because in dealing with family members that are still religious, that can be extremely polarizing. So what we have done, and I know other organizations have done this, we put together potlucks for those who either didn't want to be around their religious family at all, or they wanted to just hang out and chat with us for a certain period of time. And that is okay to do. 
And uh, also we have our event. We had our first ever convention at sea last year. And we're having one again this year. And uh, one of our premises is that we party and bullshit. <laughs> Because in dealing with some of the things that we deal with all the time, there has to be an opportunity for us to relax and unwind. And I will tell you something. Many of our members had never been on a cruise a day in their lives. There are so many people who have given their lives to their religious communities that they have not lived for themselves. And that is one thing that we seek to change within our organization is for people to live their best lives openly as secular, atheist, non-believer, however you identify, but to live your best life first because that is how we continue to maintain our community. But this is how we also build it. We started our convention at sea. And in doing so, we changed lives. This is a submission from our Being Changes Lives campaign that we launched last year, where members and allies submit, um, they submit testimonies about our organization, how they left religion, they thought they were alone, and they found black non-believers. And they've also expressed their support for black non-believers. Uh, the young man in this picture was our the organizer for our Milwaukee affiliate. Unfortunately, he passed away in February. Oh. He was very, very young. He was in his early 30s, just suddenly. And uh, we, of course, contributed to his children's um, scholarship fund and uh, funeral expenses. But it was a very, very tragic event. But that's also how we showed that we were building that community, because we helped to support our own, mm -hmm. especially in their time of need. So we have changed lives as an organization. What should we be doing as a community? We should be providing support, yep. first and foremost. Our community, we, we pride ourselves on our intellectual capability, our intellectual prowess. But when it comes to openly identifying, that can be, that, that's still very isolated. Because granted, once, you, once you have come to this realization, <laughs> Where do you go next? Who else do you talk to when your religious family doesn't want to talk to you? Right. Which is a thing. It is, it is, uh, that is a reality for many of us. So in addition to the educational part, the, uh, the science, educate, the skepticism, support in our communities that we build is very, very important. Resources are very important, and that could be literary, that could be in, um, that's in some of everything that we, that we think of. Uh, resources, books, information. Um, if there is a service that you can offer to people and to your organizations, that counts as resources. And of course, money is always a good resource. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, one of the most important. But it isn't the only thing that can be contributed. So just keeping that in mind, resources take on and, and also, again, with media resources, there are just all sorts of connections that we can build upon to help support our community. Opportunities, paid and volunteer. Now, most of, I, even with Dragon Con, a lot of this is volunteer efforts, mm -hmm. which is very, 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 very much appreciated. Um, paid is always better, <laughs> <laughs> but when we know that this is a community that is still is still very it's still very new, especially the expansion part of it. A lot of it is volunteer, and you're putting in a lot of your blood, sweat, and tears. I know I certainly have, mm -hmm. but it provides opportunities also to grow new activists who are getting involved, who are finding the community. Because much of it is still very new, it is still up to us to build it. That was one of the what is that line from Fill the Dreams? If you build it, they, they will come. come. And at the time that we got involved with the community, there wasn't an organization for black atheists who were trying to get folks um, organized in person. There were other black atheist groups, 
but we were the only organization that was getting people together on the ground. And guess what? We couldn't fight for the other organizations to do it. We knew that we had to do it. Right. And also work with others along the way. And so in, in um, providing those, and that also provided other opportunities, again, for people to participate, as well as people to get involved and start organizing and start amplifying their voices. Because as an organization, some of our members have written books. I can recall one time where there was one of our members. Um, he, was, he continuously talked about how it was hard to openly identify. He had to have two separate Facebook accounts, one for his atheist page, one for his atheism, one for his family, and how hard it was to, you know, to date women, particularly black women, mm -hmm. because we are still one of the high, the most high religious, religious demographics. A few years later, he comes out with a book called The Everyday Atheist. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> like, what? So really, we have seen the courage of our members and what they have been inspired to do as a result of Absolutely. coming to, term more, to more terms, to better terms with their non-belief as well as finding the community. Networking. That, that goes along with opportunities. Mm -hmm. And networking comes in many forms. Uh, an event, in a, a convention like this overall, we have been connecting with many people who didn't know that there was a community. They never knew it. They've been coming to this because, you know, it's science, it's gaming, it's comics, it's TV. <coughs> and a lot of them are atheists. Some necessarily aren't. Some are consider themselves skeptics, but skeptics in a, another kind of way. <laughs> We've come across some folks who believe in aliens, ain't that right, Madison? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and believe in one to argue us now. But um, this was an opportunity for us to, and, and for everyone here that is on this track, to connect and help bring more folks into the community. Because even with a large event like this, which is great, mm -hmm. many of them may have never thought to actually organize with atheists and secular groups. And so this is part of networking, kind of going into events that we may, may not have thought of before and bringing some folks in. And having fun, going back to the party and bullshit thing. <laughs> If I didn't love what I was doing, I don't think I would be here. Uh, this became very, very important to me, late 2010 to 2011. And it just so happened that what I was doing, my, my field of work, um, helped with the building and the development of Black Nonbelievers as an organization because my job was in the execution of things and making things happen, putting things together. So here are some important things to remember when we are building this community and trying to sustain it. We are still growing and you may need to create what, is, what isn't already there, as I said before. Every group slash community isn't for everyone. Know the difference between lead and supporting roles. So we have a lot of folks who may come past our table and say, well, I'm not black. This, <laughs> this may not apply to me. But as you saw in the slide, and as you may see today, and as you have seen over the course of the convention, <coughs> there are plenty of white folks and other people who support us as an organization because guess what? What we go through really does affect everybody. Mm -hmm. It affects you too. <clears throat> it affects some of the people you may know. And so your support of our organization helps not only us grow, but it helps the community grow. Yes. But it's also important to know <coughs> what you can and cannot speak on behalf of when it comes to representing an organization. So knowing the difference between the lead and supporting roles is very, very important. It is not necessary for white folks to be at the forefront of every damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Reach. <laughs> and I say this with love. <laughs> well, 
because of the fact that we are still very much living in a white supremacist world, we really are, where now the races are emboldened, now more than ever. For those of us who are progressive, for those of us who are serious about progression and change, the voices from the communities that are represented really do need to be amplified and we should be working more together. Right. And there's a way for us to work together and acknowledge what is going on without robbing anyone of their agency. So just keeping that in mind. Utilize, not use, fellow organizers, members, and resources. Even in the short seven years, which almost feels like a lifetime, in the, the seven years that I have been active in this community, I have come across many opportunists. Now there's a difference between opportunities and people who are opportunistic. People who are looking to graft themselves and put themselves in the middle of any community and organization only to boost themselves. That has been an issue. And a lot of this work tends to fall on the very few. It is a lot of hard work. But knowing how to kind of balance that out and spread that out a bit is very, uh, the organizers tend to be very overworked. <laughs> and I, I speak from experience on that. <laughs> but um, utilizing us to a point where, yes, we are able to get our voices out there and others and to build that community and speak on the issues that are not just important to us but to everyone um, requires that we are not putting too much work on the people who know how to do it where we are covering for those who just aren't. It is important to be dedicated, genuine, and sufficient. Dedicated means that, again, even when we don't want to get up, <laughs> even when we don't want to do this work, we still do it. Because there are times with, with the, when we are, when we are uh, battling the evangelicals, and when we are even dealing with folks who are struggling with their religion and still carry some of those characteristics <coughs> over into the secular community, because a community is a community, and it is made up of people, and people can be shit. Yep. <laughs> but it is important to remain dedicated and to be genuine about what it is that you're doing, as well as being very sufficient, being dependable, being reliable. I have this thing personally where I have to be on time every single time. <laughs> I do not run on what is called CP time. <laughs> but, and we understand that things happen, you know, they happen, but when we're talking about chronic lateness, we're talking about people who are late to everything, that is, that is a no-no for me. <laughs> but that is a part of a personal principle that I have, that I'm always on time, I'm always there ahead of time, and because we know, I don't know how many times we've heard this weekend, I thought I was the only one. You know, thank you for being here because we are serving a community purpose. Again, it is not just about me. It is not just about my notoriety. It is not just about being on the cover of this article, which I appreciate has occurred. It is not just about being in the Playboy magazine. It really it is and has been about connecting with those people who need us and as well as those other organizations and organizers and people who needed to see us. And in doing that, I have, I have come across others who are just as genuine and dedicated <laughs> and sufficient in what they do, including the folks here at DragonCon, which is awesome. And just know this, if you don't come correct, you will be checked. <laughs> <laughs> So we have come across, there was an instance, there was an incident uh, last year, between last year and this year, of an organizer in the New York City area who was trying to put together a conference. Oh. Yeah, the atheist conference. Yeah. Now, I have once considered this person a good friend because 
seem to be supportive of black non-believers, as well as the movement. But the interesting thing along the way is you begin to figure out what people's capabilities are along the way. And um, unfortunately, we found out that there was a history of manipulation with this individual, which reared its ugly head when they were trying to put together this conference. And um, what happened was he got called out. And I think as a community that values evidence, you know, we value ourselves, we pride ourselves on the information and the evidence, and uh, hey, we need, what is it? We need receipts, right? Mm -hmm. So when people are coming with those salesmen, or who happen to think that this work is easier said than done. <laughs> and I have this, uh, I know personally for me, I'm a, I, I tend to be a very, very patient individual. But if I see something that looks a little <laughs> odd or seems a bit funny, then hey, I may say something about it. And we are a community that, yeah, if you have said or done something wrong, the, the women now are starting to speak up. The women are starting to speak up about what's going on in the community. And also, overall, about what has been happening to them. There are people of color who are speaking up. There are young people who are speaking up. And so, I like the fact that when you're building a community, sometimes there is discourse. There is dissent. We're not going to agree on everything. And it should be about problem solving. Okay, we have this problem, what are we going to do about it? It can either be rectified, you know, we can either, you know, we can, re we can revise and change some things, but some things we may just have to eliminate. That's fine. We don't have to be afraid of that. Because even with our marginalized communities, there are some things we have to manage, and that is perfectly okay. So in closing, in March of this year, before the American Atheist Convention, before the Playboy magazine, in addition to running Black Nonbelievers, starting it, developing it, for 10 years, I was the event services manager at the Centers for Disease Control at the Royal Campus right near Emory University, uh, not too far away. So yes, I was running my organization, growing the organization, working a full-time job. I have a family, I have, I, have a, I have a husband, and I have three children. So just imagine how much I was doing. Easy. <laughs> I make it look easy. <laughs> but in March of this year, I made a choice to resign from that full-time job and take on activism full-time. I decided to dedicate myself to the movement and to my organization. And uh, because it needed to grow, I needed to make a choice. There was, um, you know, some other things that happened along the way. You know, I pretty much outgrown that job. But, so now, in addition to, I said, I, I'm 100% I'm involved with black non-believers and other aspects of the movement. Again, I still serve on the board for American Atheists. I also am now part of the advisory council for the Georgia Degree Arts Project, which is Rights, Responsibilities, and Respect. It's a project of the museum out of DC. Hmm. And what they're doing is implementing more comprehensive religious education in public schools in, in certain Georgia counties, which means that they are learning about all religions and those who are not religious and atheists. So Woo! it is an interfaith mm -hmm. initiative. So I now serve on that advisory council. Wow. And I've also created a Patreon, which I hope to get your support for. And what I do, for, if, you're, if you're familiar with Patreon, it is a content building, um, a content building engine for podcasters, speakers, activists. And what I do is I create community building content, as well as I talk about some offhanded thoughts that I have. I'm a very unorthodox individual. <laughs> no. And there are some things that, yes, <laughs> there are some things that 
I cannot always express in a public form, like this, one, for example. <laughs> and there are some things you probably just don't want to see there. But I talk about them on my Patreon because it is a better way for you to get to know me and my life experiences as well as my activism. And there may be some things that you can learn from. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can support my Patreon and have access to some things and there are also some giveaways that I have on there um, if you become a, a, a certain uh, level of a, a certain Patreon uh, uh, supporter. And this helps me with my activism. It helps pay my bills until I can find that other full-time job that I can get paid doing what I love. So it is important for us to, and this is a part of the community building that is so very, very vital. <clears throat> there is a lot of dissent right now, to put it mildly, <laughs> in the atheist community. <laughs> That's really mildly. But what this does is it helps us refine our approaches. It helps us refine how we manage our spaces, how we manage our organizations, and how we manage each other. This is how we know that as a community, we're alive. When we, when we are loving on each other, that's how we know we're alive. When we're fighting with each other, <laughs> that's how we know we're alive. It is a part of the human experience, and the human experience should dictate that we are learning something every day and learning how to do something different every day. Connecting with not just those that we love, which is very important, but also new people it is always about refinement and how to do things better. We don't have to put ourselves out there like the religious community who lulls people in with, on that emotional aspect, but emotion is something that we shouldn't, um, that we, we shouldn't take for granted in this community. It can go along with the information as well as the evidence-based practices that we encourage so strongly. So in that, in what we continue to do, what we continue to support, is how we continue to build our community and have it survive for years to come. Thank you. <laughs> And she's so right. I've been to a couple of her talks, uh, their, her meetings in Atlanta, and they are so welcoming to people of every color. And uh, it's really important to support. If you, uh, we've got a microphone here. If anybody has any questions, and what's that? Oh, you're waiting. Okay. Hey, you got a question? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so um, while others are coming up, take out your phone. Go to blacknonbelievers.org and set up a monthly PayPal. Five dollars, ten dollars, anything. Help support this organization because it's really important, it's really needed. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Science. It's science. First of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. And you. you have this wonderful grace that makes it look so easy what you do, and we all know how to think that it's not. And we definitely want you to see more of you. Thank you. You're a great spokeswoman. My question is, given currently the political strife, and in that it's becoming more and more apparent that there are bad actors, bad faith actors, that are manipulating uh, all of us through media, and trying to get us to divide the argument amongst ourselves. And of course, you know, identity politics, for lack of a better word right now, mm -hmm. is part of that. Uh, how can we, and how does your organization plan or does it have a plan, how do you deal with trying to minimize the mitigate those effects? For example, uh, in the simple me uh, messaging that way, uh, you know, when, for example, Black Lives Matter, as the name of the organization, which is for very organic, and to, I think, ho hopefully all of us can understand what the name means, but it's so easy then to, for Fox News or 
for other media, to take that and say, oh, what about white lies? What about white lies? <laughs> and is there a way, and I'm not a media person, but is there a way that you're trying to think of that in advance and try to say, okay, in a sound bite, or somehow avoid that? Is there, you know, I don't, I don't have a clear question because I'm not. So interested. how do we avoid the question? Is how do we avoid um, the manipulation of the identity politics? Sure. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Well, we've certainly had people say, "Well, what about white non-believers?" There isn't a need for white non-believers. I mean, there really isn't. Um, but also, too, um, and maybe I'm not always the best person to speak on certain things, but. When it comes to the system of the systemic racism and injustice, the, these institutions dictate that there isn't a need for a white lives matter or a black non-believers. You know, now there are going to be some folks who will try to exploit it. But what I think is important is for those who understand why it's needed to continue to speak up and work with us to help people understand why it's needed. I'm just and hoping. So I was just hoping that maybe uh, I, 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 what you said is completely valid. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I just wish there was a magical way of like, is there an easier <laughs> way of, of, of using words or, you know, to get to avoid that sort of knee jerk sort of you know how can you reach people that are. I, I wish I could wave my magic wand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, like everything else, this is going to take some serious time and yeah. effort. It is not going to be easy for us. And there are some people who will never get it. I promise you. They will never want to understand why our organizations or why these initiatives exist. They don't care. They don't want to know. They just want to stay in their little bubble. They want to exist in the back end. Sometimes you have to let them. I think the most important thing we can do is to continue to shed light on those who are working towards these changes. Make sure that we are vetting who, you know, vetting the information. There was a, there was a panel on fake news in the skeptic track the other day. So continue, having people to continue to impart that critical thinking process is going to be important. Um, it probably won't, it's not going to be like a one solution thing. And it's going to be, it's still going to be difficult. Because especially now in this age of people who are, sensationalism is a thing, which is so unfortunate because people tend to gravitate towards that. But continuing the work that we do, continuing to speak up, and continuing to connect with those who hear us and who, who understand is going to be extremely important because. I'm not sure we can do anything about some of the Fox News people who who seek to manipulate that. And yeah, they're gonna. Yeah. And also, again, check what we say. You know, check your cousins. Check your people on it. <laughs> that may take some time, but I am confident that it will start to change in the future, especially as we connect with those who are already there and also the younger folks who are coming up. You know, continue to talk about those things are going to be important. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Down. Yes. <laughs> um, you and I have talked in the past about um, how deeply religious a lot of the um, black communities can be, mm -hmm. and how it's. And, and you touched on a little bit about how when you leave that, you really are leaving your family mm -hmm. and your friends, and it, and it, it, it's maybe even more of a, of a problem within the black community because of how deeply entrenched it is and how it's grown up with that black culture. And um, would you please comment more on that and, and tell me what you've, um, if you've seen any dramatic successes or um, dramatic failures for that matter because that's interesting too. Actually, yes. Um, well, you know, the history of the black community has been one of you know, perseverance, Revolution, you know, breaking breaking these, you know, ideals, not just ideals, but rallying against and fighting against injustice, you know, and, and things that have been perpetuated against us. The 
The church, though, has been the sustaining community through a lot of those times. Um, do I think it deserves to be revered as much? No, I don't. What's happening now, though, is that while a number of, a large number of black folks are still religious, um, We've helped provide, even in this weekend, whenever we come to Dragon Con, you know, again, we never fail to um, connect with those who are like, wow, I can't tell my family, you know, and I'm still going mm -hmm. to church. For them to know that there's an outlet for them, whether they come and meet with us in person or whether they contact us through email or through social media, to know that we're here has been very important. Um, as far as um, there has been some really good changes, even with uh, there is a even with this most recent incident with the pastor who basically assaulted Ariana Grande during Aretha Franklin's funeral. Oh yeah, there are a lot of folks calling that pastor out. Unfortunately, it still comes with a lot of patriarchal stigma, especially when it comes to the way she was dressed as being an excuse, which is bullshit. <laughs> There are a lot more folks now who are challenging the institution of the church, which is something that is very, very good. You know, because our primary focus is to help those atheists who are already there and those who are questioning. Um, you know, I don't think everyone's going to get there, not in my lifetime, but um, I have seen a good change in the number of people who are starting to openly identify as atheists even though the Pew research numbers are still pretty high. And also finding those atheists who, there, because there are some like me who weren't formally raised religious. And so it's good to continue to reestablish and redefine that narrative that the black community has only been religious. And so in imparting that information, you know, and in connecting with those people, there have been connecting with other folks. There has been some significant change from what I've seen in the seven in the seven years since I've been active. Thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, Mandy, you know, I live uh, in Charleston, a couple blocks away from the AME Church, where a racist killed nine people worshiping, mm -hmm. and then they had services after. I went to their service. And of course, some people were praying, but there were a lot of people talking about social justice and prayers aren't going to do it. We need to cooperate, white and black together, mm -hmm. to change our culture. So I was quite encouraged by seeing that people are understanding that we need to work for social justice. And this church had a long history from slavery on working for social justice. So I hope we can can uh, bring some of the people in African American churches to focus more on what we can do for social justice rather than thoughts and prayers. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Herb. I remember I attended a, well, I was at a conference in Pennsylvania in uh, Harrisburg a couple of years ago. <clears throat> this was before the woman who uh, got in my face in Atlanta. <laughs> but I had a conversation with a black woman who was attending a pastor's birthday ceremony. And uh, she came across the table, and she came to the table, and she said, well, you know, I, I, I love the Lord, but I respect people's right to believe what they want. We got to a very, very good conversation about birth control and the issues of, you know, certain statistics within the black community. That and we both agree mm. that there needs to be more comprehensive birth control, more comprehensive conversations regarding sex and sexuality in our communities. And when it comes to racial justice as well, um, yes, the thoughts and prayers, it's good to see that many are waking up on that. Look, that is the, the civil rights movement wasn't just born on thoughts and prayers. <laughs> it was born on about people who knew that something needed to be done. And there were people from different backgrounds that did it. And we have a unique opportunity within the atheist and secular community to continue to build those bridges with those, even if they don't believe firmly as we do, that we can find that common ground in order to improve uh, conditions. So, I yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Herb. Hey, hey. Hello. Uh, since I know you following me on Facebook, I've got a question. It's, a, it's more of a personal one. Okay. Are your kids paying any price for your activism? 
So do you even want to talk about it? No, I, I actually will. No, I am concerned. I was concerned last year about my youngest son, Miles, who has a friend who he, both of them participated in the Georgia State um, Tech Science and Technology yeah. Competition. And the parents of the friend were extremely religious. And one day I went to go pick him up because they were, you know, studying and practicing. And I had on my walking by sight my faith shirt. And so I was like, whoever when I walked in the house, I was doing this. I covered up my shirt because I didn't, the parents were very nice people. But they had one of the they had some wall art that said something about um, you know, blessed are they who serve in the Lord. And I was like, oh. <laughs> But I will tell you that uh, my daughter, who recently graduated with her undergraduate, uh, with her undergrad degree from Johnson Wills University, in high school, she had an assignment to write a memoir. And the teacher had been making, previously making religious references. He had previously made religious references. And so in rebellion and in defiance, she wrote her memoir about why she acknowledged herself as an atheist. Wow. Now, mind you, before then, I didn't know that she openly identified as an atheist. Mm -hmm. It was sort of her coming out. And um, you know, she had seen the activism with black nonbelievers, with, um, with our activities. And she didn't tell me until after the paper was submitted. And she was concerned about what the teacher would, would do. Yeah. And I told her, I said, well, we'll wait and see, but if he gives you any trouble, you let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out she got a 95. Woo! Okay. 